so listen, I need all the fathers to come to the front right now. All the fathers to come to the front. Ladies, you could chill here and watch the video and kick it with us too. But I need all the fathers to come to the front, the real fathers. Not you fathers that show up when it's convenient. Not you. I'm talking about you fathers that are there every step of the way, if you're allowed to. Now, if you're not allowed to and it's, it's out of your control, then okay, cool. But if you choose not to be in your kid's life, or you choose not to protect your children, or if you choose, you know what I mean, not to be a father, not just exist in that space. You know what I'm saying? I need all the real fathers to come to the front. This video, I feel like this video is going to be for us, right? Because the title of this video is Three Fathers Who Got Revenge. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not encouraging. Let's, let's go on and put that disclaimer out there right now. I don't need nobody to want, well, L told me to do this, this, that, and the third. I'm not encouraging no type of violence, period, point blank. Let's get that established. You know what I'm saying? But I need the real fathers, man. I feel like this video is going to be for us. Um, I'm a father. I can only speak for myself. Um, when, when, the moment your child is born, you 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 really hold someone in your hands that you look at and you say, I would die for. I would die for. You you literally, it's it's an undescribable moment when they take that baby and they first place that baby in your hands and you look and you didn't know that you could ever have, you know what I'm saying, emotions for someone other than your spouse like this. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to describe if you're not a parent. Me just saying it to you, it won't really set in. It's that moment when they place that baby in your hand and you're cupping the head and you're holding the body and you're you're all these range of emotions are going through your body. You realize this is a person that I would take a bullet. This is the person that I would lay my life down for. I feel like this video is about to be for us, man. I truly do. So shout outs to Criminally Listed. If you haven't subscribed to them, go do so. And um, yeah, we're going to check this video out. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. Join the fam. Real quick moment of silence for the haters. That's enough. Now run the likes up. Make sure y'all hit the like button. Let's go. Number three, Luis Lesoir. In 1922, 21-year-old Albert van der Vos married 17-year-old Jean Lussoir in Antwerp, Belgium. Sometime after they got married, Jean gave birth to his half twins. After the twins were born, Albert went back to the woman that the newspaper said he found amusing before his marriage. Jean was obviously upset by this. That's when Albert came up with what he thought was a brilliant plan. Albert had an identical twin brother, so he had his brother pretend to be him, and he moved in with John. What the Amazingly, this scheme worked for a while. But then Jean figured out she was living with Albert's twin brother. So what the f Who would do that to somebody? Bro, are you... Who would do that to some? Oh my, yo, man, that's, I just want to apologize to that person for the, how, how, how could you do that to somebody? You would send your twin, that's so many different levels of disgusting at the same time though. You would send your twin brother over there to be with your, ah. With some sickos out here. Amazingly, this scheme worked for a while. But then Jean figured out she was living with Albert's twin brother. So she took her twins and moved back in with her parents. Tragically, after she did, one of the twins died. Albert was furious and he blamed the death on his parents in law. He then asked for Jean to come back to him. 
But after everything that happened, Sean was really not interested in mending her relationship with Albert. So in 1925, Jean asked for a divorce. Albert did not take this well, so he shot 20-year-old Jean five times. She died as a result of her wounds. As Jean's father, Louis Wassar, stood over his daughter's dead body, he vowed to get revenge. Albert was arrested and he went to trial for the murder. Louis Lassoir attended the trial and each day he brought two guns and a dagger because he planned on killing the man who murdered his daughter. Sound like a time to kill, don't it? This sound like a time to kill, the movie A Time to Kill. That's exactly what this sound like, bro. I ain't mad at him, though. But he did not get the opportunity. Albert ended up being sentenced to 20 years of hard labor. There was an appeal, and Albert only ended up serving seven years. What? When he was released, he moved to Paris, France. It wasn't long before Albert became engaged to a rich widow. They planned on getting married in June 1933. Jean's father, Louis Lassoir, traveled to Paris to look for his former son-in-law. On his sixth trip in April 1933, he learned that Albert was living in a hotel room. He waited near the entrance of the hotel for two days. Then he saw 32-year-old Albert Van de Vos step out onto the street. Louise shot him four times and Albert fell down on the street. Louise walked up and put a fifth bullet into his daughter's killer. He then went to the closest police station and turned himself in. That was gangster. That was what you call a home run. That was a home run right there. That was gang. Uh, listen, I'm not supporting it, bro. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? I ain't telling nobody to do that. Nobody. Because ultimately, you know what I mean? You still, if it, it, you leaving your family out here. You know what I'm saying? When you do that, you feel good for a moment, but then ultimately, was he really worth it? Some of y'all are saying yes, and I can understand and agree, but I cannot prom promote that. You know what I mean? Louise went to trial in December 1934. The judge pointed out that Albert had already been convicted and served his sentence for murdering Louise's daughter. A few years? He ain't served no sentence. Louise said that the only way Albert could atone for what he did was by paying with his life. He also said he fired five shots at my daughter he has now received five from me. Justice is done. Even though Louis Lassoir admitted in court to murdering Albert Van de Vos, he was acquitted of all charges. Number two. I ain't gonna lie to you, bro. That's, the, that's one of the few times I've seen the justice system end on the right side. I cannot lie to you. That was one it. I mean, you know what I mean? Like... That's my daughter you just killed, bro. Who else is going to disagree with what this man did? Is it right? No. Is it understandable? I, I can't say that. I can't say that here. So I'd be, I'd be wrong. You know what I'm saying? But that's, that's one of the few times. Jay Maynard. When Julia Maynard's mother was a baby, she was adopted by a man named Raymond Earl Brooks. They lived in Coleman, Alabama. Julia isn't exactly sure when, but when she was really young, Brooks started sexually abusing her. It most likely started in the mid-1990s when she was around the age of four. The abuse carried on for years. She said, I don't remember when it started happening, but I know it was for a very long time. It was long enough for me to think it was completely normal. It made me to feel that he actually loves me in a different kind of way than my mother and father loves me. 
When Julia was eight, it came to light that Brooks had been molesting her. Brooks was arrested. In late 2002, Raymond Earl Brooks pleaded guilty to charges regarding the sexual abuse. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but he was released early in February 2005. He had only served about 27 months in prison. Julia grew up and eventually she had three children of her own, but she had never gone over the years of sexual abuse. She said she suffered daily from it and she had post-traumatic stress disorder. Julia did not think that was fair that she had to suffer every day of her life and Brooks only had to serve two years and three months in prison. On June 8, 2014, Julia, who was now about 22 years old, said something to her father, 41-year-old Jay Maynard, about Brooks. Julia had not seen Brooks in at least 12 years. Julia didn't even remember exactly what she said to her father about Brooks, but it stirred something in his mind. Bro, he in a motorcycle club. It's like he set it up probably like Sons of Anarchy. Apparently, what Brooks did to Julia had been festering in Jay's mind ever since he found out about it. He hated that the man stole his daughter's innocence. Jay did not think it was fair that he had abused her for about four years and had only served two years and three months of prison. So that day, Jay got on his motorcycle and he hit the highway. He knew that 59-year-old Raymond Earl Brooks lived with his parents in Berlin, Alabama. Along the way, he stopped at the Berlin Plaza Quick Stop, which has a barbecue restaurant inside of it, called Mad Dog Mike's BBQ. Jay also had a stepdaughter, and at the Quick Stop, he saw his stepdaughter's ex-boyfriend. Jay thought that the man was abusive to his stepdaughter. So he pulled out his gun and fired at the young man. He missed and the bullet went through a window and into the quick stop. The young man ran into the quick stop and hid. Jay calmly walked into the quick stop and demanded to know where the young man was. Mike Hayes, the owner of the barbecue restaurant, was also armed and he told Jay to leave without causing any more trouble. Jay left the quick stop and got back onto his motorcycle. He drove to Berlin and went to the home where his daughter's former abuser lived. He found 59-year-old Raymond Earl Brooks outside of his parents' home. Jay shot Brooks once and he died nearly instantly. Jay got back onto his motorcycle and drove out onto the highway. A police officer pulled him over not long afterward and he was arrested. After Jay Maynard's arrest made the news, many people in his community supported him. They thought if they were in the same position, they would have done the same thing. Many people thought he was a hero. A Facebook page was started and thousands of people joined to show their support. Also, several fundraisers were held for Jay's legal fees. Other people do not think that Jay did the right thing. This includes Mike Hayes, the man who owns Mad Dog Mike's BBQ. He called Jay a psychopathic lunatic. He pointed out that there were five or six people inside the quick stop when Jay fired into it. Mike wanted to know what Jay See, that's why I can't endorse. You know what I mean? As much as I understand and know, in my heart of hearts, I would feel the same way. The reason why is because when people see red, you see red. You did this to my daughter, bro. I don't care who's around. It goes down where it goes down. It ends how it ends. So when I start letting off, I'm not seeing that it's a bunch of innocent people around and people could lose their lives. You know what I'm saying? That's why I can't, you know what I mean? Endorse it fully and you have to let the justice system play out. But who, who, who? It's easy to say 
sitting in this position in my chair reacting to a video. It's easy to say when I'm not in that person's shoes or in position. You know what I mean? So I completely, wholeheartedly get it. And on top of that, I'm a parent. I don't have a daughter. You know what I mean? So I can't say I understand what he felt having his daughters molested and him feeling like him not knowing and he wasn't able to protect her. Bro, that, that bond between a father and a daughter? Shh. You see what it'll make you do? Still be considered a hero if he accidentally killed an innocent person. Nearly two and a half years after the shooting, in November 2016, 43-year-old Jay Maynard pleaded guilty to murder for killing Raymond Earl Brooks. He also pleaded guilty to attempted murder for shooting at his stepdaughter's ex-boyfriend. For the murder conviction, he was sentenced to 40 years of prison. He was given an additional 20 year sentence for the attempted murder. Both sentences are to run concurrently. Jay said he pleaded guilty so that the details of his daughter's abuse would not come out at trial. Jay's daughter, Julia, was thankful for this. She told AL.com, basically he took it so that I didn't have to relive the molestation and also be on the stand in front of a bunch of people talking about and bringing back memories of the molestation. My father was protecting me like a father should do. He is an amazing father, actually the best. He loves us so much. Jay Maynard is currently serving a sentence at the Bibb County Correctional Facility in Brent, Alabama. He'll be able to apply for parole in May 2029 when he'll be 57 years old. There is a petition to have the governor pardon Jay. Jay still has a lot of support. However, other people think he should serve his sentence. They also find the support for Jay to be troublesome. Pat Morrison, a journalist with the Los Angeles Times wrote, is an unsettling cheering section for someone who allegedly meted out a private punishment against a sex offender who had pleaded guilty and served prison time. And when an Alabama father or a California mother usurps that role, they are not heroes because vengeance is not justice. Injustice, not someone's child, becomes a victim too. Jay was ultimately trying to get revenge for what happened to his daughter Julia. So, what does she feel about the situation? In 2016, after her father was sentenced, she said, I'm going through hell. Everything comes back to me as to why this has happened. I feel like it's my fault. I'm sad, but yet mad. Number one. And see, that's a tough spot to be in. Because anybody looking at this situation now, and how this situation right here played out, you could easily sit here and be like, well, dang, if I tell my dad and he goes and kill him, then I lose my dad for 40 to 60 years or life. I don't want to do that. So they'll be hesitant to tell. Like, it's, this is real life situations, man. You know what I mean? So think about that before you leave your comment, either disagreeing or however you feel about this. Think about it. This is not easy for a person to do because they'll see this play out, this story here, and that may make them hesitant about going to tell their dad. It's, bro, it's no easy way out of this situation, especially when you know a dad that loves you and would die for you. Andre Bamberski. In the summer of 1982, 44-year-old Andre Bamberski lived in a small village outside of Toulouse, France. He was a successful accountant. He had divorced his wife, Danielle, about seven years earlier, and he had just started a new relationship. On the morning of July 10th, 1982, Andre's world was shattered by a phone call from his ex-wife. Their 14-year-old daughter, Kalinka Bamberski, had been found dead in her bed that morning by her stepfather, Dieter Kombrak. 
When Danielle called, the cause of death was unknown, but there were no signs of homicide. It looked like the death was natural. Andre simply couldn't understand how his daughter could have died in her sleep. Kalinka was attending a French boarding school, and she spent the summers with her mother in Kronbach in Lindau, Germany. Kronbach was a respected doctor. Kalinka was a happy girl, so Andre highly doubted that she died by suicide. She was also healthy, and she skied, skated, and windsurfed. Andre knew that it was incredibly rare for an athletic and healthy teenager just to die in their sleep. Andre anxiously awaited the results of the autopsy report. The autopsy was performed two days after Kalinka was found dead, and Andre received the report three months later. What Andre thought was odd was that Kronbach was in the room for the autopsy, and he was quoted several times in the report. This was completely against protocol. The two medical examiners noted that some fresh blood was found around the vagina and the labia had been torn. But they thought it most likely happened post-mortem. Inside the vagina was a white substance, which was never tested. The medical examiners found puncture wounds on her arms, right leg, and thorax. Kronbach said that the night before Klinka died, he had given her a shot of iron cobalt. He said it was to help her tan. For some unknown reason, a toxicology test on the blood was not performed. Also, Kalinka's genitals were removed, presumably so that they could be examined later. The report said that no cause of death could be determined. The report said that forensic tests on tissue and blood samples needed to be performed. Andre Bambersky was devastated by the loss of his daughter, and initially, he wasn't suspicious that anything sinister had happened. But after reading the autopsy report, he began to wonder if Kronbach had anything to do with her death. Why else would he have been at the autopsy other than to try to cover up what he did? Andre wanted to know the results of the forensic testing on the blood and tissue samples. Andre called his ex-wife and she told him that the tests had not been performed. This only made Andre more suspicious. I was about to say, I think she actually would be bold enough to stand there and lie for him. So you gotta sit. Let me, let me just wait. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me not jump to conclusions just yet. So he asked the German authorities to look into his daughter's death. They finally did in early 1983. On the last day of Kalinka's life, she went windsurfing. She came home at about 5 p.m. and said she wasn't feeling well. The family ate at about 7.30 and then Kalinka went to bed early. But before she went to bed, Kronbach said that he gave her an injection of iron cobalt. He had a news story as to why he gave her the shot. Instead of helping her with her tanning, he said it was to help her with her anemia. Krobok said that Kalinka got up at about 10 p.m. to get a glass of water. Then he said later that night she was still awake and reading in her bedroom. She asked him to turn off her lights. Krobok said that when he found her the next morning, Rigor Mortis had already set in. He said he injected her with the drugs Coramin, Novafil, and Isotopin in the hopes of reviving her, but it didn't work. A forensic expert condemned Kronbach's use of the drugs to revive her and the iron cobalt. Kronbach was a doctor, and he saw that Kalinka's body was in rigor mortis. Therefore, she had probably been dead for hours, so it was far too late to inject her with something to save her. And we not even doctors and we knew that. The expert thought that Kronbach injected her with these drugs while she was still alive. Mm -hmm. She was possibly even dying or had just died when she was injected. 
This would suggest that Kronbach had something to do with Kalinka's death. Since Kronbach claimed he found Kalinka dead that morning, hours after she died, he possibly claimed he injected her with those drugs to cover his bases in case testing was done on the blood. As for the iron cobalt, it would have not helped with tanning and should only be used in rare cases to treat anemia. It's dangerous to inject someone with iron cobalt after they have just eaten, which Kronbach claimed he did with Kalinka. It's dangerous because it can lead to symptoms like fever, nausea, and vomiting. In the most extreme cases, it can lead to cardiac arrest or respiratory failure. The forensic expert concluded that the injection of iron cobalt caused Kalinka to vomit in her sleep and she asphyxiated to death. Andre then became convinced that Kronbach had injected his daughter with iron cobalt and raped her. He either intentionally killed her afterwards to make sure she would never tell anyone, or he accidentally killed her by giving her the iron cobalt, which caused her to choke on her own vomit. Andre thought that either way, Kronbach was responsible for his daughter's death. Despite the findings, the German authorities refused to press charges. What? Just over a year later, Andre went to Lindau where Kronbach lived and practiced medicine and handed out pamphlets that accused Kronbach of murder. The pamphlets also accused the police and the German government of covering up the murder. Andre was arrested and charged with defaming Kronbach. Andre bonded out and he returned to France. He was tried in absentia and found guilty. He was given a huge fine, but he could avoid paying it by staying out of Germany until the statute of limitations ran out in five years. Andre pressed the French government to conduct their own investigation. They launched one in 1985. They exhumed Kalinka's body and found nothing to aid in their investigation. They asked for her genitals, but they apparently have been lost and they have never been found. This made it impossible to determine if Kalinka had been raped. In 1988, the German- Bro, this one is pissing me off, bro. Are you serious? What do you, what do you, what do you mean they were lost? Like, they screwed this scene up, from, uh, this autopsy up from the jump. Authorities handed the tissue and blood samples over to the French authorities. Based on food particles in the respiratory tract, the experts concluded that Kalinka had asphyxiated to death. Five years later, in April 1993, in France, Dieter Kronbach was charged with voluntary homicide. It had been nearly 11 years since Kalinka died. If Kronbach was convicted, he was looking at a sentence of up to 30 years of prison. The French government requested that the German authorities arrest Kronbach and hand him over. The German government refused. So Kronbach was tried in absentia in March 1995 and he was found guilty. He was sentenced to 15 years of prison. This really had no effect on Kronbach's life. He continued to practice medicine and he remained one of the social elite in his city. The German government was never going to extradite him and they considered the trial in absentia to be illegal. As long as Kronbach didn't step foot on a French soil, he'd never have to serve time in a French prison. In January 1997, Dieter Kronbach was arrested. He had drugged a 16-year-old patient and raped her. The girl woke up during the rape, but she was paralyzed because of the drugs. She told her parents about the rape, and her parents went to the police. In August 1997, Kronbach was convicted of rape, and he was sentenced to two years of prison. His Two years. The license was also revoked. But since Kronbach had a good reputation in Germany, his sentence was suspended, so he didn't have to spend a day in prison. 
After Kronbach was arrested, six women came forward and said that they had also been raped by Kronbach. They hadn't come forward sooner because they didn't think that anyone would believe them. Or they weren't exactly sure that the rape had happened because of the drugs that Kronbach had given them. After Kronbach was sentenced, he sat down for an interview with the journalist and he said he didn't rape the 16-year-old girl. He claimed that she wanted to have sex with him. Also in the interview, he called Andre Bambersky crazy. In 1999, Kronbach left Lindau and moved around frequently. Andre hired a private detective to keep tabs on the man he believed killed his daughter. It turned out that despite having his medical license revoked, he continued to work as a substitute doctor. He was eventually arrested for fraud and practicing medicine without a license. After he was arrested, he was examined by two psychiatrists. They said that he was a narcissist who believed he was beyond the law. They also said he was a compulsive sexual predator who would sexually assault any patient or staff member if left unsupervised. Kronbach even admitted to the psychiatrist they had drugged and raped several women, including a 16-year-old girl. Kronbach was convicted of fraud and practicing medicine without a license, and he was sentenced to 26 months in prison. He served about 18 months. In France, along the border of Germany, is the city of Malouze. Early on the morning of October 17, 2009, the police in Malouz got a phone call. On the street, someone had found broken glasses, shoes, and blood. The police went to the area and chained to a fence outside the prosecutor's office. They found 74-year-old Dieter Kronbach. He was bleeding because he had suffered a blow to the head that caused a skull fracture. Around the time that he was found, Andre Bamberski, who was in Malouz, called the police. He told them that the man chained to the fence was Dieter Kronbach, a wanted fugitive. Kronbach was taken to the hospital and then he was placed under arrest. Andre was also arrested. The police searched his hotel room and they found 19,000 euros in his safe. Close to Kronbach, the police found a phone bill belonging to a man named Anton Krasnichi. Andre was questioned by the police and he was asked if he knew Krasnichi. The police suspected that Andre hired him to kidnap Kronbach and smuggle him into France. The 19,000 euro. Bill, this father was going to stop at nothing. You hear me? He was going to stop at nothing. He had one goal in mind. This was the payment. Andre denied knowing Krasnichi. Andre was released on bond after two days of questioning. Krasnichi and another man, Kasia Babaloni, were also arrested for the kidnapping. The German government demanded the release of Kronbach. They argued that the statute of limitations on his conviction from his trial in absentia had ended. The French government said no, and they reinstated the charges against Kronbach. Dear Kronbach went to trial in October 2011, over 29 years after Kalinka Bamberski died. The defense argued that the trial should happen because Kronbach had been illegally brought into the country. They also pointed out that he was the victim of a kidnapping and an assault. Those arguments were noted, but overruled. Several experts who examined Kalinka's tissue samples testified, and they said she had asphyxiated to death. Other experts said that the labia had been torn before death, which led to the bleeding. They also surmised that the white substance was most likely semen. Three women testified that Kronbach had drugged and raped them. The jury... Y'all remember that punishment video we watched yesterday? 
If you done, go back and look at it. Imagine these people doing that in those times and what they would have got. He deliberated for several hours. They found Deer Cronbach guilty of voluntary violence leading to an unintentional death with aggravated circumstances. The conviction carried a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. 76-year-old Dieter Kronbach was sentenced to 15 years of prison. Andre Bamberski went to trial for kidnapping in May 2014. Andre admitted to consenting to the kidnapping of Kronbach, but he claimed he was not involved in the actual kidnapping. He was found guilty of kidnapping and given a one-year suspended sentence. The men who committed the actual kidnapping, Anton Krasnichi and Kasia Babaloni, were also convicted and sentenced to a year in prison. For Andre, it was worth it. His nearly 30-year crusade for justice was finally finished. Dear Kronbach was released in February 2020 after serving nearly nine years of prison. He was released for medical reasons. 30, but does nine. 30 years, but does nine. How? Make that make sense to me, somebody. He returned to Germany to live with his daughter. Many people believe that Kalika Bamberski is not the only person Dieter Kronbach killed. In 1969, Kronbach was married to his first wife, 24 year old Monica Hensa. Seemingly out of nowhere, Hensa fell seriously ill. She became blind, mute, and then paralyzed. Hensa was taken to the hospital. According to Hensa's mother, Kronbach pushed the doctor who was attending to her aside and then injected her with something he called snake venom. 24-year-old Maria Hensa died a short time later. Kronbach was never criminally investigated for the death of his first wife. At the time of this video, Dieter Kronbach is 86 years old. While he may not have served as much time in prison as 83-year-old Andre Bamberski would have liked, his reputation has been destroyed. Instead of being remembered as a respected doctor, he'll be remembered as a notorious serial rapist and killer. Thank you so much for watching. And they had the nerve to ask the question, do they think that's the only person he's, ki he's killed? I don't think so. I don't think that's the only person. You know why? Because when that little girl was dying, he injected her with that stuff like he knew what to do. He, in his mind, he's done it. Well, not in his mind, but he's probably done this before. So right before rigor mortis set in, he injected her with this to mess it all up. And you know what I'm saying? Erased Trace except for the semen he didn't get rid of that he couldn't get that but he was definitely trying to mess up the scene so it wouldn't trace back to him this ain't his first time bro you could tell and now he marries a woman and she her health just fades real quick and she goes through all of these type of changes and downfalls and her health rapidly decreased you telling me this ain't him man please Listen, man, like I said, you know what I mean? On this platform, I got to be responsible. You know what I mean? Because if I go out there and say, yo, these guys are heroes, or I go out there and say, yo, this is what, then somebody goes out there, do that, kills some innocent people, then they try to say, I told them I can't do that. Can't do that, and I won't do that to my family. So I'm going to leave it at this, man. Y'all get at me and let me know what y'all think in the comment section. Three fathers, who got revenge? How do y'all feel in the comment section?